Hello, Cuskell community. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm, as a bit of a square peg, I couldn't pass up the invitation to be a curious thinker. Just love it, it's fantastic. And what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes is share some of my curious thinking about um, governance, conduct and regulation. And in terms of the theme of the conference today, um, tomorrow's experience today, this is, a, this is really true. Um, if, you're, if you've got good governance, good corporate governance and good conduct today, that helps you to prevent in the future regulatory sanction, reputational damage tomorrow. So it's really, really important. And I love Nathan before me talking about beyond compliance. We really are in a beyond compliance world, I think. So corporate governance is increasingly demanding a more direct consideration of societal issues. And I think this is really well illustrated by, on the slide, I've got three big societal issues in Australia right now that illustrate this point. So the first one is trusted public and private institutions. And if you just look at the financial services sector and banking, for example, it's probably, you know, we've, hopefully we've seen the all-time low. But what goes with that is, is an increasing sense of the importance of that in society. I think that um, this is going to require corporates to reset and actually to sort of forge a new pathway that has a stronger foundation on governance and conduct. And I've got on the slide just some, what, what the associated corporate or business issues are that are at the forefront. The second one is, is about the strengthening desire for more inclusive growth and opportunity in society. So corporates that reduce inequality, so this is sort of a call to action for corporates, reducing inequality, um, to, to really leverage that inclusive growth and opportunity. If you're reducing inequality, you're helping to strengthen economic growth and prosperity at the same time as creating sustainable and a more just society. The third one is society's commitment to future sustainability. Did anyone say, for example, climate change? Um, this is really a call to have regard to the environment, um, to sustainable natural resources, um, and really to have that as a focus and make sure that your growth is aligned to purposes around that. So that's just to illustrate this, what I call the convergence trend, if you like, that sits behind everything else I'm going to say about governance, conduct and regulation. So to governance, governance is the way authority is exercised and controlled in a corporate. Um, the convergence trend, I think, illustrates we're in a new era of governance um, at the moment. The business environment is changing. Earlier speakers have talked about ethics, morality, all of these concepts are now coming in and, and sort of merging. Um, and they're merging with corporate knowledge, corporate skill and experience and the expectations on corporates. So you'll know BlackRock CEO Larry Fink writes an open letter to CEOs every year. Really interestingly, his 2019 letter was called or titled Purpose and Profit. Larry Fink, he really gets this convergence trend, as I've called it. He calls on companies to, to actually um, really address pressing social and economic um, issues. He talks about needing to have a framework for navigating this and that the framework has to really start with a clear embodiment of the purpose of the organisation. That should be seen in the operating model and in the strategy. On the green box on this slide is the, is the really interesting bit, I think, where he talks about the purpose not being a marketing tagline, but being the fundamental you know, reason for being, for creating value for stakeholders. And that's, I think, the key point that he makes. Now, this is a form of shareholder activism. Shareholder activism has been around for a very long time, but it's changing. If you've been watching it, it's changing. So back, if you go back to the 1980s, it was really the, the chief goal was corporate control. Not so much now. Now that it's not about you know, resting control, it's about using the lever to have existing um, corporate leaders create more value for a broader range of stakeholders. It's an intensifying sort of shareholder activism and what comes with it is a rising interest in corporate governance, a broader interest. I want to just go to the, um, the Royal Commission the Banking um, and Financial Services Royal Commission, but I want to preface my remarks here by noting that 
Um, the messages of the Royal Commission around governance as a theme resonate across the corporate community. They're sector agnostic. This is not just for financial services industry. This is broader. And I think in relation to governance, the Royal Commission serves as a frame around accountability, stewardship and value creation. There's a few things on that slide that, that sort of flesh out um, Commissioner Haynes' comments on that. But I want to talk to accountability in terms of um, the fact that we have um, an increasing uh, or a global trend in terms of the rise of individual and corporate accountability regimes. So we know in Australia we had Bear, the Banking Executive and Accountability Regime. Um, that's rolling out to superannuation trustees and across all financial um, services entities. Um, this is about making senior people, directors and senior officers, accountable um, for taking reasonable steps. So what does accountability look like? It unpacks that. You've got, to be, you've got to take these reasonable steps to ensure, essentially, that you prevent um, any damage to the prudential standing of the organisation if you're a bank. Um, and in the UK, they've had the equivalent senior manager regime there since 2016. Um, interestingly, by the end of this year, that will cover some 14,000 financial firms in the UK, which is massive. Again, it's about making those people who, by reason of their role in the organisation, um, can actually cause harm, can cause significant harm to the interests of the organisation and its customers accountable, putting them on the hook. Um, Hong Kong has the manager in charge regime since 2017, similar. Singapore's got a draft on the table. Uh, New Zealand, South Africa, Ireland all have proposed regimes. This is just trending globally. I think stewardship, Hain talks about directors um, owing their um, first responsibility to the corporation. Um, and that that involves, importantly, setting priorities and, um, and managing resources. And that's stewardship. And the concept of stewardship is not new. It comes from the Middle Ages. Um, I think about Downton Abbey. I know that's not Middle Ages, but it's about, it used to denote the office of manager of a large household. Today it's really defined as an ethic that embodies responsible planning and use and management of resources. So essentially it's about taking care taking care of the organisation of those who are affected by the organisation. Regulatory frameworks around stewardship are evolving. Um, I won't go into the detail of those, it's not time, but there are four key areas of interest in, this, in these evolving regulatory frameworks for effective stewardship. Having a clear purpose is number one. Constructive oversight, engagement and challenge is number two, that's a call out to boards. The institutional culture and the structures around that is number three. And number four is disclosure and transparency. So value creation, moving to value creation, Hain actually called out entities preferring pursuit of profit over the pursuit of any other purpose. Um, he talks about needing to drive enduring value over the longer term. And that's really what we mean by value creation across a broader range of stakeholders. So when we come out of that, um, and I think of this slide as a bit of an Alice in Wonderland moment, um, quoting Lewis Carroll, it's curiouser and curiouser. Because this is the spectrum, I think, of the evolving accountability of directors and officers of corporations that we have now. And if you move, it's, it's about where do we play in this, in this spectrum. It's less and less certain for, for lawyers. Um, so if you go from the left-hand side, you've got your core, like Section 180 of the Corporations Act, central duty of directors to um, you know, have regard to the best interest of the corporation, act for a proper purpose, etc. Associated director and officer, statutory duties come after that. But I want to get to um, shareholder, um, shareholder primacy doctrine, because it starts to get a bit interesting there. Um, so in Australia, there's no doubt that legally, company directors and officers owe their duty to the corporation. Um, and Australian case law has tended to grant primacy to shareholder interests over other interests in the past. But Hain really took aim at that. He said it was a simplistic view and that the, the boundaries of what directors and officers have to consider go beyond just thinking about <coughs> shareholders and that they need to sort of, it's not a binary choice, he said, you've got to think more broadly. That thinking moves closer to the UK. So under section 172 of the, of the UK Companies Act, the, the core duty, statutory duty of a director or an officer is to promote the success of the company, which is quite different to the one that we have. And that brings us to social licence. So, you know, a social enterprise has a mission, not just to make, rev earn revenue and make profit, but to respect and support the environment and its, and its stakeholder network when it's doing that. 
in a really significant move, I think, away from shareholder primacy towards this evolution towards a, a social licence. In August, the New York Business Roundtable published a statement seeking to redefine the purpose of a corporation. 181 CEOs signed that as a, as a sort of a new modern standard for corporate responsibility. And the purpose, they say, is to promote an economy that serves all Americans. So we can really see this sort of shift happening. We have the ASX corporate governance principles and standards. We all know that um, the big debate that went on earlier in the year when our fourth edition was published in February, would we or would we not have a social licence component in that? In the end, it didn't quite make it there. But we do have principle three, which is about acting ethically and responsibly. Community standards and expectations at the far end. This is the one that a lot of directors are going, oh, what does it mean? You know, this is really uncomfortable for us. We're used to going to our lawyers, getting advice. What can we do? What can't we do? This is a whole new world. It's, it is a bit opaque, but it is increasingly used as an arbiter of what's acceptable. It certainly was the language of the remit of Hain, and it's made its way into APRA and ASIC language as well. In fact, into some prudential standards. Um, conduct. So in February, Justice Hain made 24 referrals of misconduct to our um, regulators for potential um, civil or criminal prosecution. We'll have to see that play out. What's interesting, I think, and perhaps lesser, lesser known, and my point here is about how important conduct is. This is the world beyond compliance and the world of conduct. In April, the Federal Attorney General um, announced a comprehensive review by the Australian Law Reform Commission of Part 2.5 of the Commonwealth Criminal Code. So this is the code that deals with corporate criminal responsibility. And if you don't know, what that code already does is it, it essentially, and I'm, I'm dumbing it down, if there's, a, if there's an intent element of an offence committed, say, by one of your employees, um, it, it attributes that to the body corporate where the company has expressly, tacitly or impliedly authorised or permitted the commission of the offence. Now, there's a very low bar at its lowest. That can be proved where a corporate culture existed to encourage or tolerate, it's very low, the commission of the offence. So that's, how we, that's the criminal um, standard that we have at the moment. So the point is conduct is really, really, really matters. I want to go back to um, 2018 and the APRA panel inquiry report into the Commonwealth Bank. Um, it provides really useful guidance, I think, because the panel actually marked out the boundaries for what we call conduct risk management. Um, and conduct risk management by the bank, the panel inquiry said, um, was characterised by a lack of intellectual curiosity and critical thinking about the big picture and not listening to important external voices of stakeholders and, and the community expectations, the language was there even then, around what is fair treatment. So this is a really interesting point and I think this would stand you in good stead for the way forward. What's the difference between asking could we versus asking should we? The difference is often poor or good conduct. And I think this is a really great question to take forward for boards and senior decision makers. Um, when, when you're thinking about what you're going to do next and are we on message and are we doing what we think we're doing. Jumping back to the Royal Commission, um, and at the very heart of it, Hain um, made four key observations which were in the middle of the circle and he identified six what he called fundamental norms of behaviour. Now, in relation to conduct, if you apply a conduct lens to this, this is actually really about getting cut through, through all the legal complexity, all the, all the rules, etc., and just focusing on the basis of what, what, why those rules are there and what the purpose or intent of the rule is. And I, quite, I think it's quite a nice sort of mnemonic for people just to, 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 to sort of how you behave in a corporate environment um, as a test, because it's a lot easier than going and looking at the law all the time, but if you, if you actually follow this, you're probably not going to fall foul of too many rules. Um, so there's a real, it also highlights the fact that departing from these fundamental norms is, is actually not seen as being so acceptable now. Another good thing that you can um, apply um, in your own organisations is, is thinking about conduct blind spots. So do we have any? How, do we know if we have any? And what sort of things are we monitoring? What indicators are we monitoring so that we can find that out on an ongoing basis? And some of the earlier speakers this morning sort of touched on this. I think when you're doing this, um, the idea, another question you can ask is, do we do no harm? Because 
Um, doing no harm is actually about correcting moral asymmetries. It's about fairness. And if you apply the APRA question, should we, instead of could we, that's more apt to, um, to address those sorts of asymmetries between a large corporate and an individual, for example. And this is this sort of ethics and moral component that's coming in. And if you do cause harm, are you accountable for it? So, you know, as a, as a, as a legal professional, if I, if I give someone some advice and they followed my advice and, they, and that ends up as some sort of disaster, should I share in, in the harm that that's caused? What are the consequences back on me for that? So when we're looking at our contact blind spots, have we got any around how do we address, you know, the harm that we have caused as well? Regulation. Um, I'm going to start with... Um, it's a little short case study from the Royal Commission, but it's not a Royal Commission case study, if you understand what I mean. Um, it's just an analysis. Um, this is where, in the Royal Commission, banks, and a lot of evidence was given about um, the charging of fees or interest in amounts that were greater than had been agreed with a customer. And I, th I found this aspect really interesting because there was evidence led um, by bankers that said, well, this was due to processing and administrative errors. So it's kind of like, you know, yeah, we, you know, we, we can have those, everyone has those, that's life. Hain just called that out, and I think this is really good guidance for what are the expectations now around regulatory compliance. So we are moving beyond compliance to more to a conduct, um, you know, broader conduct concept. He made three key points about your um, processing and administrative errors. Firstly, the entity that sells a product should have adequate systems in place before that product goes out there into the world for day one. Secondly, if you're going to offer, you have to, you can't really offer what you can't deliver. So you have to make sure that, you know, performing a contract in accordance with its terms that you've put in place in the first place is now a standard of behaviour that the community expects. And then if you don't deliver, to the point I made earlier, um, you've really got to remedy that default and the consequences of that default, however broad they are, quickly and then get on with it. Um, so really this is good guidance, I think, in relation to governance con and conduct and what regulatory compliance is looking like now because it's shifting. On regulators and regulation, and there's a little bit of an um, analysis, of, again, from the Royal Commission, obviously it's changed significantly. Um, the regulators didn't escape any sort of criticism um, um, in, in the Royal Commission either. Um, I think we're going to have to adjust as organisations our expectations around the sort of interactions we'll have with our regulators in the future. They won't be the same as we've had in the past. Um, and, you know, if we take ASIC, for example, um, ASIC has an enforcement mantra of why not litigate, which is somewhat different to, you know, previous sort of the whole enforceable undertaking regime, for example. And APRA has established two new teams. I don't want to talk about the close and continuous monitoring team, but I do want to mention the uh, ASIC's new corporate governance task force, which released its first report um, on the 2nd of October, which was specifically about um, the governance of non-financial risk, which is essentially conduct risk, right? So um, they found that, you know, the organisations that were subject of that, of that surveillance and report had... Um, really not set up a risk appetite statement around conduct risk and non-financial risk that they really believed in. And then the way they would then manage risk didn't, didn't align with whatever the risk, the stated risk appetite was. And that wasn't being overseen by, you know, a sort of a, a competent and skilled and, um, you know, review committees, etc. But this task force is here to stay indefinitely. It is not just about financial services entities. They looked at 21 entities in their first review, six months of review um, across all sectors, ASX listed entities. So it's, a cor it's about corporate governance more generally. And they're going to issue, they've said another report um, before the end of this calendar year, which will focus on executive remuneration. So this is just you know, the changing um, type of um, regulation that we're having. The other thing I want to mention here is increased penalties. So we've now got um, criminal penalties that are significantly increased, um, maximum imprisonment term from five to 15 years. On the criminal side of things for a corporate, 10.5 million um, or um, three times the benefit derived from, from the offence or 10% um, of the annual turnover of the organisation in the 12 months leading up to the offence. Um, criminally, that's not capped. 
We have a civil penalty regime that's capped at 525 million if it's a civil penalty. Really important to note, a lot of provisions under the Corporations Act um, that weren't caught by the civil penalty regime now are, and probably the, the, the interesting one is if you fail to act efficiently, honestly and fairly, if you're a financial services organisation, that's now a civil penalty provision. So I, I think I'm out of time. I just want to leave you with um, this last slide on regulation. I think it's a really good question. Do you game the system? Is that what you're doing? To really think about this um, when you go back to your organisations. Because the question brings back the interconnectedness between governance, um, you know, conduct and regulation. And I hope I've just talked you through some of the key drivers of that very quickly. The trending convergence of societal issues with corporate issues. Globally trending corporate and individual accountability regimes. Um, stewardship and value creation and that evolution um, and where that's going. Looking to the should we question, not the could we question, um, and blind spots around that, and then addressing and adjusting to more forthright regulators who have enhanced, significantly enhanced powers. Thank you.